So Peter, take it away and thanks again for coming. Well, thank you very much, Jerry. And uh, you know, that's, um, you know, this chapter and uh, Jerry are at the cutting edge of this, uh, of these seminars and doing these Zoom seminars. And so I invited Yogi from down south to, from the California Federation to join in to see how uh, this chapter does it, you know, uh, since you guys do it better than anybody else in the nation. And uh, with my uh, other groups I work with, uh, um, you know, I, I, this is my first Zoom call with uh, a NARF chapter. So this is kind of like, a, we're kind of demo, demoing a best practice that can hopefully be duplicated throughout the nation to the other, uh, the other NARF chapters around. But thank you, uh, uh, Jerry, for, uh, you know, pushing this forward and having it happen. Um, this, um, you know, seminar, this talk is, um, comes from our national training team. And uh, it's focused on basically federal, basically federal employees about to retire and people who've already retired. Since most of us have already retired, I think I might be the only active employee still um, holding on. Um, I'm, I'm gonna focus this talk on Medicare, FEHB, and you, or better known as, do I have to turn on Part B if I don't want to, or Peter, stop telling me what to do. So that's basically what this talk is. And I'm gonna to try to focus, and, and I want you to be able to leave this talk with understanding your rights as a federal employee, an FEHB, uh, program participant and what your rights are around turning on Medicare um, Part B, whether you're going to do it or not. Uh, what are you going to do about Medicare A when you turn 65 um, and basically uh, be empowered to go back to uh, OPM and go back to the FEHB plans every year and ask them what's in it for me. So Let's uh, see if I can get the slideshow going. Um, so we'll start off with what is Medicare? And it's, it's uh, Medicare's insurance. And again, this is in the news, uh, Medicare for all. There's a Democratic National Convention going on now. You have Bernie Sanders, everyone talking about Medicare for all. Well, Medicare for all kind of means something for everybody. Uh, it's something different for everybody, but this is what basically Medicare is. And I spend a lot of my time these days explaining what is Medicare. So it's health insurance for people over the age of 65. When you're 65, you, you turn it on, you apply for it. Or folks who are under 65 with certain disabilities, um, or if you're under 65 and you have uh, kidney failure or ESRD. Uh, it's administered by my agency, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. And, uh, Jerry was saying I'm the ship liaison, and if you look at my picture, I'm on the Enterprise orbiting the Earth right now. But it's uh, that is all contained within the Centers for Medicaid and Medicaid Services, which is in Health and Human Services. Um, we administer the program, but Social Security, you know, is always I always pick on Social Security. They're where you go to enroll in Medicare. You enroll in Medicare because one thing Social Security does better than any other organization on the, on the planet is enroll people in stuff, you know, and they, you know, the Congress recognizes it's a law the way it was, um, you know, since 1965. So you enroll in Medicare through the Social Security Administration. Um, I just wanted to mention the Railroad Retirement Board, just because we're in the West and uh, a lot of folks like, you know, Jerry or Department of Labor folks. Uh, the Railroad Retirement Board, uh, that system is for railroaders. It uh, predates the Social Security system. And uh, they, um, they enroll people, uh, you know, so railroads go know, know to go to Chicago, I mean, go to the, their, their home bases in Chicago. It's the Railroad Retirement Board and they have a slightly different Medicare card than the rest of us have. So um, I won't talk any more about the Railroad Retirement Board since none of us are railroaders, but you may have a friend who is because we live in the West. Medicare has an alphabet associated with it. It has huh? Medicare Part A, okay. Medicare Part B, Medicare Part C, which is Don't also know. known as Medicare Advantage, um, and then Medicare Part D, which is prescription drug coverage. And if you know, look at my slideshow, if you can see the slide for the people who call, you know, who, uh, who are using their iPads, uh, we have the nice little symbols above it. So I'll go into it. So 
Medicare A is called hospital insurance, okay? And what does it cover? You know, so you have Medicare Part A, and it basically covers your inpatient hospital stay, your stay at a skilled nursing facility. Um, uh, it covers your home health care services. Uh, it also is uh, also covers um, hospice care and uh, blood when you're in a, as an inpatient. You may need some blood or if you're going to need some surgery. Um, what does Medicare B? B, um, it's referred to as medical insurance and it help, helps cover your doctor services, your outpatient medical and surgical services, again, outpatient, uh, your home health care services, uh, the clinical lab tests, the uh, durable medical equipment stuff you might need to be at, have at home, um, diabetic testing supplies, and then all the preventive services that have come into Medicare since 1965. Um, so, Again, also under uh, B is the home health services, and it's uh, the, what, what we mean by that are medically necessary part-time or intermittent care, uh, nursing care, uh, physical therapy, uh, speech or language um, pathology services, occupational therapy, part-time intermittent home health care services, um, Medicare social services, medical supplies, durable medical equipment, and uh, injectable osteoporosis drugs. And uh, when it's covered, uh, home health care services are covered, you pay nothing for the covered services. Um, also under Medicare Part B is durable medical equipment, which is like oxygen supplies, hospital mm -hmm. beds, which you, know, you might need if in your home. Um, and starting again next year, you're gonna start hearing about a competitive bidding project that we're uh, revving up again. And um, so for this to realize, I guess just for you as a retired Fed, is that Medicare would be paid, we'd be paying 80% um, of the Medicare approved amount for that piece of equipment like the hospital bed. And FEHB would pay for the other 20% of the Medicare approved amount. So I wanted to go very quickly through the Medicare Part B preventive services. These are all preventive services that you, as a person who's 65, you know, and on Medicare, you can kind of expect to be covered. So um, Medicare makes, you know, so you, you know, Medi 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 Medicare makes all these uh, uh, available. Um, so very many of my friends, haven't had a haven't had a visit haven't had a preventive visit at, in years haven't seen the doctor hasn't had screenings haven't done any of these things because they they're young they're under 65 they don't need to so just remember you can start doing a lot of these preventive uh, med uh, preventive services um, you know when you come into Medicare um, um, so the next thing I was going to bring up is, you know, you're 65, you turn on Medicare, and you think it's going to be a one size fits all. Well, it kind of was in the old days, not so now. Uh, sorry, this charts from 2018 it should be 2020. My, uh, my bad, I'll have to change that. Um, but um, without getting into the weeds, I just wanted to give you guys the concept. A lot of us work until the age of 65, then we retire. And then we, you know, turn on Medicare, and lo and behold, uh, we find out that hold it, we're going to be paying more uh, because we have, uh, you know, this retirement uh, income coming in. We've actually worked, or we sell a house. So that's called Irma, and uh, you deal with that with Social Security Administration. And after you've been retired for several years, you can go back. To Social Security and say, hey, uh, my income has leveled out. Um, I'm no longer working. I'm retired. I've sold the house. I've rebought a house. I've downsized. Um, and I'm now uh, making a lot less in my retirement. And they, we could, they most certainly will recalculate it. If you don't do that and just let them um, recalculate on themselves, that eventually the IRS will send a tape to Social Security and they will redo the calculation 
and that will adjust how much your monthly payment for Medicare Part B is. Um, so, call, um, call, call me, call me later. Call me later, Mary. Okay, Thank so, um, watching a Zoom presentation. So, I just wanted to go about Medicare, talk a little bit about Medicare Part B. And again, this is all done within Social Security about automatic enrollment and Medicare enrollment periods. Um, so, you don't have to decide about Medicare Part B if you already are. Um, uh, receiving Social Security benefits or if, you're railroad, or if you're a railroad or already receiving railroad benefits. Uh, the initial enrollment package is available three months before you turn 65 and this is 25 20, or, the, or the 25th month of disability benefits if you were disabled under 65. It's going to include your Medicare card. So, um, uh, so it's automatic if you're already getting a Social Security check under the age of 65. Um, so, when can you enroll in Part B? Their initial enrollment period is the seventh month period surrounding your birthday month, the time you turn 65. The general enrollment period is like, let's say you're a wise guy, you turn 65, you're no longer actually working for the federal government, you're just not going to turn Medicare on. Uh, then you have to wait till the general enrollment period, which is every year, March to uh, January through March. And Medicare doesn't become effective until July 1st, and then there's going to be a 20, 10% penalty for every 12 month period. You could add Medicare, but didn't. And then this is the special enrollment period, which affects most of us in this room, is the uh, eighth month period uh, beginning when you retire from federal service. So usually it's, uh, we're over age of 65, we've been working with the federal government, we've been covered by FEHB, um, plan and then we decide to turn on uh, Medicare, we have a special enrollment period. Again, that's all dealt with with uh, Social Security. So here comes the, the, the fine print, enrolling and delaying enrollment in Medicare. So when you turn 65, what about enrolling in Part A? What about it? Well, if you're if you're working, basically every Fed, everybody, everyone on this call, working or retired, as you're, if you're age 65 or above, turn on Part A. And during our question and answer, I'll tell you why, because I, I had something happen to a dear friend. Um, it's premium free for most people. You've paid as you went, uh, so you're not going to pay anything for it. And you'll have hospital insurance in case anything bad happens. So you're actually working, doesn't matter if you're still working with the federal government. Um, so your Medicare Part A, it will be automatically turned on at age 65 if you're already receiving Social Security or railroad retirement benefits. Um, now, the only reason that I can, can think of by delaying Part A is if you're enrolled in one of these high deductible health plans with a health savings account and you'd like to keep it because there's, all, there's um, fine print with the IRS about you can't contribute to your SF health savings account once your Medicare coverage begins. And they consider uh, your Medicare coverage beginning as soon as you turn on Part A. So if you don't stop your HSA contributions at least six months before your Medicare enrollment, you may occur a tax penalty. I'm not a tax lawyer, I'm not an IRS uh, agent, but I'm telling you, you should uh, take note of this if you're one of those folks with a high, um, if you have a health savings account. Um, if you'd like to continue contributing to your health savings account, your working Fed, you shouldn't apply for Medicare, Social Security, or railroad retirement benefits. So let's move to Part B. If you're 65 and you're still working and you have FEHB, it's going to be, it may be to your advantage to delay and be. In fact, it's going to be to your advantage to delay B. Um, and this also includes your spouse who's covered under FEHB. FEHB remains the primary payer. I'll be talking about this a little bit later on. Uh, your spouse, age 65, remains covered under FEHB as a primary payer. Um, part, apply. For Part B upon retirement, you enroll in an eighth month special enrollment period and uh, 
uh, you, there's not going to be any penalty for you because you were actually working or actually covered their FEHB. Um, luck, uh, so this is this form called the CMS L586 for all the guys who are about to retire. And Jerry, you can back me up on this because there's a bunch of retiree seminars we're at. And we remind people to get this form, go to your HR office before you retired. And it, it just attests to, um, hey, yeah, sure, Jerry was a fad. Yeah, he's been working here in the Department of Labor. He can now, he can now get uh, Medicare turned on penalty free. Um, and it's of course available on um, medicare.cms.gov and you just type in CMS-L564. If you're retired and have FEHB, Medicare Part B may be a good choice for you. Uh, Medicare Part B and FEHB plans combine to provide complete, almost complete coverage or complete coverage. Um, it's a little bit like round tape pizza, you get the wombo combo, you get the full package. Um, FEHB continues to pay for the primary benefits um, uh, and it also pays for your prescription drugs. Um, consider Part B as it uh, pays for the costs involved with seeking uh, providers outside um, the FEHB plan network. And also consider Part B if you want to check out a Medicare Advantage. And if you are a TRICARE for Life person, you don't even have a choice. You must take Medicare Part B. Um, I brushed upon Medicare Advantage and think about Medicare Advantage, that's Kaiser, and you'll hear words like Kaiser Senior Advantage. That's a way to get Medicare coverage. It's also called the Medicare Part C plan. Um, there are Medicare plan options that are approved by Medicare. They're run by private companies and you can use a network of doctors or hospitals. Some of the plans offer, some, some, some FEHB plans offer Medicare Advantage plans. The one in our area in San Francisco is Kaiser. They'll, they'll offer you a uh, FEHB plan. Um, so a um, couple of years ago, I brought this up to San Francisco chapter and came, it came up a lot of questions. And so I redid the slide and uh, with our central office. And so I'd like to reiterate re, 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 that you can suspend your FEHB if you're enrolled in a Medicare Advantage plan. You have the right to re-enroll in FEHB if you later lose or cancel your Medicare Advantage plan coverage but you must wait until the next FEHB opening season to re-enroll in FEHB unless you involuntarily lose your Medicare Advantage coverage. Um, so to enroll in Medicare Advantage, you or your spouse can suspend your FEHB coverage to enroll in Medicare Advantage plan. I don't know, I don't know too many of this chapter, um, San Francisco chapter or Marin chapter folks who do this, much more popular than Walnut Creek for some reason, um, but uh, um, but so you and your spouse have the right to suspend your FEHB coverage to enroll in a Medicare Advantage plan. You're not going to pay that stiff FEHB premium when you suspend it. Uh, OPM doesn't contribute to your Medicare Advantage plan premium. Okay, that, that's you got to pay for. If you later want to enroll in FEHB program, you may do so only during the next. FEHB open enrollment period, um, or you are moving out of the state and you move to another Medicare, outside the Medicare Advantage service area. Um, contact your retirement office to provide documentation to suspend the FEHB coverage and enroll in a Medicare Advantage plan. Um, so, um, trick question. The retirement office is OPM back in uh, Boyers, Pennsylvania. So, the suspension of the FEHB is effective the day before the Medicare Advantage plan coverage begins. Now, you see all this, I used the word suspension. I didn't say the word quit. You're never gonna call OPM up and say, I quit FEHB. You're never gonna say those words. Never say, I quit, I'm out of here. You're not saying that. You're just, this is, a, I'm talking about a right you have as a federal employee to suspend your FEHB 
Um, so I'll, I'll have a couple more slides to talk about that. So, um, so I just wanted really quick facts. Um, uh, you know, many, again, uh, uh, this is available to all people with Medicare B. Uh, as um, so Medicare, oh, sorry. I'm moving over here to, uh, um, okay, uh, Medicare Advantage is available to all people with Medicare B, A and B both. Uh, it's provided there, um, the benefits are provided through Medicare prescription drug plans or Medicare Advantage uh, drug plans, and then some of the Medicare plans. There are higher premiums for some of those who want to enroll after your first eligible without credible co coverage, FHB is credible coverage. So for Medicare Part D, um, all of us are getting lots of, uh, starting in September, a lots of advertisements about Medicare Part D. You can't go into a CVS, Walgreens, or anything to find out about Medicare Part D. The good news for everyone on this call is you don't need it because FEHB is credible coverage. FEHB is better than Medicare Part D. So, and if at a later time you say, oh, I really want to have a Part D plan, you had credible coverage, so you don't have to worry about any Part D penalty. Um, so the only people who would want to have Medicare Part D and, and, and that I ever work with, I say, call me up one-on-one. -on -one. Um, if you happen to have a fellow, uh, a friend, a fellow Fed friend who's having problems with making ends meet uh, in the drug area. Um, so for all of us who have FEHB, we most likely will not benefit from enrolling in Medicare Part D. Um, and we could always enroll later at some other time if we, if we want to. Um, so just to reiterate for those TRICARE for uh, Life loved ones, um, you must have Medicare Part A and B to keep uh, TRICARE for Life. TRICARE for Life will send you a note saying our records indicate you turn 65, turn on B now if you want to retain your TRICARE. It's a very directive note that comes in the mail. It's not a phone call, it's a mailing, and it usually happens about three months before. It also happens for your dependents. So like, yeah, we, are, we noticed uh, your spouse has turned 65. You know, they must turn on Medicare Part B if they want to retain their TRICARE for Life. Um, uh, okay, and of course, if you're actively working in, uh, you know, a, a, as an active duty member in the uh, armed forces, you don't need to have Part B to keep TRICARE because you're actually working. Um, if you have TRICARE, you don't need to join a Medicare prescription drug plan because like FEHB, it's just like it's credible coverage. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about how this works. Medicare FEHB and you, um, just how it, how it works. So if a member or spouse has Medicare and a FEHB plan, um, have, and, and so they're actually working. So you have FEHB as an active employee or your spouse is an active employee. Your primary payer even if you have a Medicare A, both A and B on, your pri pri primary payer is going to be FEHB, okay? Because you're actually working. So there's no reason to turn on Part B, see that? Um, so if you're, if you're a member or your spouse has FEHB as a retired annuitant or spouse, the primary payer is Medicare. So Medicare pays first, Blue Cross Blue Shield, for example, would pay second. If you're uh, receiving workman's comp, because a lot of us, uh, you know, retire out with the workman's comp there, workman's comp uh, is the primary payer uh, for the injury and Medicare pays for all other services. Um, just because Jerry's on the call, I gotta, I gotta pick on Jerry again. Uh, Reemployed annuitants, uh, employees in a position that conveys FEHB eligibility, then again, no matter no matter if you have A and B on, FEHB is the primary payer. Uh, Medicare would pay secondary. Uh, if employed in a position that does not convey FEHB eligibility, 
then Medicare A and B would pay first. Uh, and then FEHB plan would pay second. So key points. Medicare Part A is not required, but it's recommended if you're still working and have FEHB. And then in the question and answer, you could ask me a question about, because I have a friend who listened to me and actually uh, had, had an issue. So again, you're only doing this, you're, you're, you're 65 and over, and you're only doing this, uh, it's insurance, in case something really bad happens. Um, contact your health plan when you turn 65. Um, for coordination of benefits purpose. So like, you know, your FEHB plan, just give them a heads up. I'm turning 65. Medicare is turning on just so they know what's going on. Um, and uh, I also wanted to just bring up the fact you can delay Medicare Part B with no penalty if you're still employed, if you're actually still working. Um, Medigap policies that you're going to see as soon as you're age 60, and lots of advertising, maybe a stack this high, uh, you know, every month, uh, um, you know, in any ARP magazine, you open it up and, oh, wow, Medigap. You don't need it. Um, you have FEHB. Uh, Medicare Part D, again, not needed. You have FEHB. So I just want to leave you some resources because I'm, you know, even though I am pretty much available 24 um, 7. <laughs> This is even actually more available. So if you have a sleepless night, um, you can call 1-800-MEDICARE and use the word agent. Say, maybe I might have to use a couple of oct octaves. Agent, agent, agent. And you'll get it through to a higher level worker and they can answer your uh, you know, Medicare questions. We look at their scripts, they're pretty good. Um, um, if you want, uh, cms.gov is, the website that's for, you know, uh, us, us, us um, people in the know, uh, fellow Fed uh, and human resource people, um, employers. So we have CMS publications available, and you can also call 1-800-MEDICARE and ask for them. Uh, Medicare.gov is the website that's for beneficiaries. So you can go to Medicare.gov. And if you notice that Medicare.gov has a whole bunch of um, uh, Medicare publications that are also available. Um, you know, I have these numbers here just more for a reference. If you ever run into problems about benefits of coordination, like if um, your FEHB plan and your uh, workman's comp and FEH and, and, and Medicare aren't playing well together, um, I have these numbers, but I've been asked not to direct people, you know, uh, to them. Um, but I give them to you because you're in the know. Um, here's a very valuable number as a Social Security Administration. I'm going to give you a super good tip on this one. Um, so if you call the Social Security Administration at this number at around four in the afternoon, you're going to get the Hawaii Call Center. They're really good. Uh, you, that's what I do is I usually wait till four. All the guys in the East Coast have been shut down. So you're not competing with New York and the East Coast folks. You're just competing with the, you know, uh, west of the Rockies. Um, and you get these folks who have perhaps the best federal job on the planet. They're, they work in Hawaii. Um, and they, um, you know, and so you can ask them all your social security questions, especially now in time of pandemic the local office may not be open. So you can call them up. Um, I don't have a trick as far as agent or getting through their automated system. I just say call after four, don't call on a Monday. And um, that's what I do. And that's what I tell the advocates to do um, is call after four, not on a Monday and not after a federal holiday. Um, and uh, you can get in and it, it does work. Uh, it works rather well. Um, also, uh, you know, again, uh, Jerry was talking about, uh, ships. What, what kind of ship is he on? He's on the Starship Enterprise. Well, I'm also, there's, um, state insurance assistance programs in, in our state. It's called HICAP. Um, they're pretty knowledgeable about FEHB, Medicare, and you, you're probably after this class better than they are. 
on FEHB benefits, but they know all about Medicare and how claims interact with um, Medicare pays first and FEHB pays second. So if you run into some problems uh, or, or you're, or you're um, working with a loved one who might have problems, HICAP is a good resource. And this is my contact information. Again, you'll have a copy of the slideshow. Uh, you can use and abuse it. Um, because I'm working remotely during this pandemic, email me is probably the best way um, or faxing it, uh, fax me something, it comes right into my email and I see it right away. Um, so again, you guys are you guys are in the club, so you can call me uh, or, or contact me when you get uh, if you, when you have a if you get jammed up, and I will try to get you unjammed. Um, I am sorry, I didn't. I wonder. I was going to. One thing I don't have on this slideshow that I will have to change is the OPM, because all of us here have to start stop thinking about. I'm going to go to CMS Central to talk about my FEHB, or Jerry's going to go talk to the Department of Labor once he's retired. He's going to go, you know, to Department of Labor, or Les is going to go to Department of Defense to find out what's going on with her benefit. Uh, once you retire, you're out of the human resource office of your agency, and you're going to go to OPM. Uh, the other thing. Um, I wanted to, well, I, I, I could want to kind of want to go into uh, questions and answers now because I'm, um, it, if you ever call OPM up, you know, don't ever use the words, I want to stop my FEHB. Uh, only use words for suspending and um, suspending is a, um, a it's, it's a thing that's available. It's a right that you have if you want to try Medicare Advantage. Um, and a lot of the a lot of the folks again, it's not a San Francisco chapter thing. Much more of a Walnut Creek chapter, which unfortunately uh, went away. A lot of folks out there didn't want to pay the 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 high FEHB premiums for Kaiser. So what they said is, I'm going to suspend my uh, Kaiser. I'm going to get Kaiser Senior Advantage. So they have to pay a Medicare B premium and they have to pay the Kaiser premium and they got to be in the Kaiser service area in, in, uh, in, in Northern California and then they get, they get this. Um, but then let's say it doesn't work out, they can always return back to FEHB, but they got to wait to open enrollment period to unsuspend. And I've yet to find a person out there who's uh, unsuspended so I can give you a good report on that. Um, um, uh, so also I've, I've, I've equipped you now to, um, to, to, um, to talk with your FEHB plan because your FEHB pick a plan where you receive benefits like Blue Cross or GIHA or, um, um, the, the uh, letter carriers plan or Kaiser. And you can go, and, and I, I encourage you every year, because the plans change their, their formula every year, the premium always goes up every year. Ask them every open enrollment period or before every enrollment period, what's in it for you? And how it can, uh, you know, how you can get everything optimized um, to care, to do your care as you age in, um, uh, you know, as, as, as you're aging. Because you know every 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 year is a different a different adventure. Like who would have thought about you know a pandemic? Um, and so um, one of my uh, you know um, yeah. So without further ado, let's get into questions and answers. Well, right. This is Leslie, and right now we don't have any questions on the chat. So should we? open unmute everybody well why don't you let people individually unmute themselves okay. uh, on the participants panel if everyone will pay attention okay. to the bottom of your screen it says participants if you click on that there is a way at the bottom of that panel to raise your hand and that's the most professional way to to participate to ask a question Yogi Riley just raised her hand. I see Yogi. 
So uh, Leslie's gonna handle this and uh, she will call on people in order and she'll ask people to unmute themselves beforehand. Hi, Peter. Uh, my question is, uh, if you are re-employed, do you have to turn off your FEHB? As a re-employed annuitant? Yeah, as a re-employed With the you, federal government? Do you turn it back on and turn off your... Well, your HR, HR is going to tell you, e either you are or you're not. You know, so they, you know, they're going to say, um, you're a re-employed annuitant with FEHB. So uh -huh. your Medicare, let's say you, you, you've already turned your Medicare A and B on. It's just a matter who pays first. So let me see if I can find that slide. Does that um, mean you still pay the so premium? This is it. Um, so uh, you are on, uh, so you're, let's say you've already picked Medicare A and B. So you're paying that. Uh, and then you are um, you're employed in a position that conveys FEHB. You're already paying your FEHB premium. This is just showing that FEHB is paying for the claim first, and then Medicare is paying second. Um, so that's that, that's all it really shows. What if it's um, suspended though? You haven't suspended anything in this slide. No, I'm saying if you suspend your FEHB and then you become a reemployed annuitant, eligible for uh, FEHB. You got to wait. Uh, fine print. That's the fine print slide. You got to wait till the next open enrollment period. Or that comes screwed again. <laughs> you didn't know, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah. So you would turn your FEHB on. Um, you would turn it on. You would, you would, or, or it would turn off. You know, they would uh, open enrollment. You could pick. Uh, you would you would want to turn it on then if it if it is yeah. Okay, Jerry has the next question. Um, just uh, I'm going to comment first and then ask something. Um, my comment is simply that um, I happen to be a rehired annuitant, and and basically the current program they use in general uh, does not affect your benefits uh there's no they you're not provided with benefits the rehire okay are paid primarily an hourly rate um and that's it uh they do pay into social security but that, but you know basically you you stick with what you have and there's no real change occurring uh my question is primarily about um the the issue of Part B of Medicare and everybody's always asking this question and, and suggesting that that uh, you know I don't really need it or I absolutely have to have it and the fact is uh, how do you address that with people Peter how do you how do you communicate to them so, how they make that decision okay so. Um, one thing, you know, I, cause I, I talked to lots of different retiree groups, you know, the FBI guys, you guys, the, uh, chapter 400, you know, Yogi's group. And, you know, I try to tell, try to tell people I'm simply explaining to you your rights. And so we as federal employees have greater rights than, well, we share our rights with Congress, uh, because they also have the right in retirement to choose to turn on Medicare part B or not. Uh, and then the correct congressional staffers and then all the federal employees in the nation have the right to choose whether to turn on B or not. Everyone else on the planet, you know, our city workers or state workers um, have to turn it on, you know, like, you know, if they want to um, have uh, health and welfare benefits in retirement. Um, so, um, so what, what, I, I try to steer clear from trying to sell, telling people what to do because feds don't like to have people tell them what to do. Or I try not to, um, you know, well, A, tell them what to do, but also B, uh, uh, you know, say you got it, you know, you, it, it's, a, it's a fundamentally a choice or it's a, but better than a choice, it's a right. So you need to be informed about what, you know, what your rights are. So, um, by turning it on, by turning Medicare Part B on, you pay more of a premium, right? But with that, you get more coverage, meaning that you're, um, you have something called coordination of benefits happen. So let's say you've you're got GIHA, 
I am down. They, um, Medicare would pay your claim first, then GIHA would pay, pay the claim second. So you have very little out of pocket costs. You know, and mm -hmm. so that, that, so you can go to GIHA and ask them, hey, I'm about to turn 65. What's in it for me if I turn on uh, Medicare? And so, well, the number one advantage is they're going to say, well, there be, there's coordination of benefits. You'll have no out-of-pocket costs. You know, it'll be you go to the doctor, Medicare pays, and then, and then the claim will crosswalk over to us and GIA, we'll pay, and that's it. Oh, and you, and you get to keep your uh, FEHB prescription drug plan under GIHA, which is great, and you're going to be happy with that. Um, and uh, the, the other thing to um, watch out for, um, and this is more in the Medicare A department, is that a lot of times I have working feds who have FEHB and I say, I need FEHB, I don't need any Medicare. I don't need Medicare A, I don't need Medicare B or anything. Well, until something bad happens. So actually I had a friend who actually listened to me turn on Medicare A and um, was still working. So I had FEHB, but what ended up happening is that he went in for an operation, um, had a blood clot popped up to his brain uh, afterwards during recovery in the waiting room and had a stroke. Mm -hmm. So was pretty debilitated and needed to have, you know, and they were gonna take him from the hospital and he was done, they, they, they handled the stroke, uh, ready for, uh, for rehab. And so he was like, okay, now for the skilled nursing facility. Huh? Well, guess what? FEHB Blue Cross, you know, this is also true for GIHA and some of the other plans. You look at the fine print of FEHB only, there's no skilled nursing benefit. So you're going home. Oh, what? And so all of a sudden he calls me up. So I called it, and and so uh, and so so I called. Indeed, I called up Blue Cross, and um, but it turns out he had Medicare Part A. So guess what Medicare A covers? The skilled nursing facility. So he had to, so so his his wife could be empowered with that Medicare A, and go to the discharge plan saying he's got Medicare A. I don't know why you're talking about him not having. And as soon as they found out he had Medicare A, of course the skilled nursing facility is available for rehab. Of course he can, you know, so doors opened up. So um, be very careful in, uh, in, in signing up for A. Getting back to B, um, uh, um, that escaped me what, uh, well, I, you know, one of the things that, that basically I was addressing was was that the only time I've heard of people saying, I don't want to do Part B oh. are two instances that I hear frequently. One is I have Kaiser. And yeah. uh, sure. that Kaiser, I, if I have Kaiser for the rest of my life and I stay in place where there's a Kaiser facility, uh, you know, I don't see the absolute need for it. And that's an argument that some people have. And I, I think it, there's a reasonable argument for that. The second argument I hear is that there's somebody uh, who's at the point where their benefits, uh, all the payments they're making for FEHB are killing their ability to be comfortable in retirement. Uh, they feel like the costs that they're paying monthly for the FEHB is too large. And so uh, they're interested primarily in, in looking outside of, uh, you know, the, the, the federal system um, and suspending or whatever. But again, I'm sort of with you. I've never had anybody who's been very, but usually even those people have Part B of Medicare because if you do that, that's part of the support for the program that you can get outside of, of, of uh, the FEHB. Uh, I've never heard anybody get back with me clearly and say, yeah, I had really good coverage under those programs and um, it worked out fine. I don't we know. have five so, people here who have questions. Yeah, let's so move on. I gotta, no, I know. 
the, the, the you know Jerry put his finger right on the issue. They're gonna, they're gonna, you're gonna run into a lot of folks in the Bay Area, Fed retired Feds who I've had Kaiser all my life. I'm and 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 they make the they make this deal with themselves. I, I've lived in the Bay Area all my life. I access all my care at Kaiser. I love it. I um, I'm never going to move. I'm never moving out. Of 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 of, uh, of of this area, and I'm okay with that um, Northern California Kaiser FEHB um, self and family um, payment, um, and uh, so I will just have I will just turn on Medicare A, and have Kaiser and have to pay that big FEHB premium and not pay Medicare Part B. I live with that. I'm not going to jump. That's what I'm going to do. And there's many feds in the past who did that. So you, if you talk to a lot of the old time feds, um, that's their, that's their thing. Jerry brought up the second issue that FEHB <laughs> monthly cost is a big number for the Northern California, you know, for the plans up here. So uh, the next decision point, and this is where the buddy, my buddies over in Walnut Creek, uh, re retired feds in Walnut Creek, a lot of them say, I'm going to suspend FEHB. That's where the suspension slide came in, um, where, is that? Um, where you are suspending FEHB um, for a, you know, a period of time and you, do, and you turn on Medicare A, you turn on Medicare B, you sign up, um, for a Medicare Advantage plan and you suspend your FEHB because you're trying to get out underneath that large monthly FEHB payment, which may be affecting your retirement check. It may be you need to be paying less. So um, uh, that, that's a strategy. I, again, I don't see too many, I haven't had too many people in San Francisco and Marin do that, but I had a lot of questions about that in uh, in the East Bay, so uh, um, and again, if you do that, don't tell OPM anything about quitting um, or your intention. I just say suspend. I want to use my right for suspension. I want to suspend my FEHB, and it's and it's basically Jerry's right. It's about the premium. The premium every year gets more and more and more. And our retirement eats more and more of your retirement up. And so, if you're in that situation, uh, suspend and then see if you can find a um, Medicare Advantage health plan that works for you. Okay. Um, Leslie, you had a question. For yeah. We're, no, I don't have a question. We're going to go on to. The, I think we have about five or six questions. So, Alice, you have a question. Yes. Uh, first of all, thank you so very much because you did clarify something I wondered about for a long time because. I'm a member of Kaiser FEHB, and then also I have Med uh, Medicare's A and B. And once in a while, I get a thing in the mail from Medicare uh, listing some things that I've done at Kaiser and saying, um, uh, I think they say that Kaiser is my primary or something. And that's anyhow, they say they're not going to pay it. And I think they say Kaiser is my primary. Maybe they just say Kaiser is responsible for this in some mm -hmm. wording. I don't know. But it's it's been puzzling to me as to who is primary but you did clarify that and so i think i'm not sure whether kaiser is messing up sometimes and trying to build medicare for things that they should have just automatically known were still their responsibility uh this tends to be things that um that are needed to fulfill some kind of a initial payment that that fehb doesn't cover periodic that i mean that medicare doesn't cover periodically or something like that Anyway, it's it's confusing, and I don't know if, if Kaiser is confused about who. No, no, they're they're really good on. Uh, <laughs> so you actually have some homework now. The problem with asking me questions is I always give homework, and so your homework on this one is to actually, well, number one, figure out. I mean, is do you have have you assigned your Medicare um, A and B to Kaiser? and your FEHB to Kaiser, because it sounds like your FEHB Kaiser person. Kaiser would love it if you did. Um, but no, you, I didn't. Got... I, I've, I've resisted assigning it. Okay, okay. So 
So you are a power, what I call a power user. Um, so you don't have to resign. You don't have to do that if you don't want to. And so what that uh, what Medicare A and B does on the side is like you have choice. So let's say you want to go outside of the Kaiser network. Let's say you get sick and you want to go to the Mayo Clinic or you're, you've been asked to come to the Mayo Clinic down in Arizona, you know, uh, you don't have to ask Kaiser's permission for anything. You go down there and just say, hey, this is my Medicare A and B, you know, and, uh, and uh, but for stuff locally, uh, the, you know, you're going to do your FEHB Kaiser. But, 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 but Medicare is still the primary payer. So they are supposed to be billing Medicare for most things, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, the, so the, 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 there's going to be a coordination of benefit between the two. So. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Roz, you have a question. You have to unmute yourself. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. So uh, my question has to do with part C, I think. So this goes back a number of years, but my mother had uh, Kaiser senior advantage. And when she went into a nursing home, um, it didn't make any sense to have Kaiser anymore because I would have to keep transporting her over there, over to Kaiser. So during her open season, I switched her to a Medicare supplement plan. And then Kaiser made me go through a very complicated process to unassign her Medicare from Kaiser. Uh, so I was wondering, um, and it, I had to write letters, and it was very complicated. I was just wondering, what is supposed to be the process? So is she, was your mom a Fed? She was a state retiree. Okay, so she was, so was a CalPERS? Yes. Okay, so what? Um, so your battle is going to be really with CalPERS, and so she's receiving her CalPERS through um, through Kaiser. CalPERS tells her when she's 65, told her, you must have Medicare A and B. And, you know, so you're, you're paying, you're, you're, you're paying your Medicare A and B. And oh, by the way, your CalPERS is Kaiser, your Kaiser CalPERS. So, um, so uh, what you did, what, what your, your battle was, should have been with, with, um, uh, you know, is uh, rather than the nursing home and Kaiser, is going back to CalPERS and picking a plan that works better for her. Well, um, I, I did that. Then she yeah. got sick right after that new plan became effective. And I had written to Kaiser and they said I had to have the letter there by, by the 10th of the month. And I did all that. And then when she went in the hospital on the new plan, Kaiser said she was a, still a Kaiser patient and they hadn't taken care of it. And that, that's why I wrote all those letters and I, I told them that I expected them to pay the bill at St. Luke's Hospital. And then they said, oh, yeah. no, no, we, we took care of it. So I just so, wondered. So that's, so you, you bring up an issue that we're all, you know, that's the, the homework for all of us really, is that, um, you know, your, your mom was lucky to have you to advocate for her with the system. So how that works for your life you know, your, you know, your FEHB or for all of us on FEHB is that we need to, you know, activate ourselves and also our, 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 our advocates. And, uh, you know, so if we're incapacitated, you know, and, and, and going to a nursing home and we need to change FEHB plans during open enrollment, um, you know, they're, they're kind of, they know how to do that, you know, or if they have a battle with, um, you know, office of personal management. So, you know, luckily, you know, you're in the right spot about, you know, NARF is the place to go really to kind of figure out where do I go with this? I need to change plans. Well, guess what? You're not changing plans, you know, <laughs> until open enrollment. And, you know, which are the good plans? How does that work? You know, uh, you know, what, what, what are the good plans? Um, you know, uh, you know, that, that sort of, that sort of discussion. So, Unfortunately, none of us get out of the business of patient advocacy for ourselves and our loved ones. And yeah, our, I'm pretty our strong and, advocate, so. Yeah. As so that's a, so, so that's the part of it. That's the part of the, the you know, part of the, the thing that happens is it's not a, a lot of times it's, you know, trying to figure out the plan. I can't tell you how many, I'm a Kaiser patient, so <laughs> I can't tell you how many times I'm sitting in the waiting room, even during the, during this pandemic, 
and I'm having people battle with the front desk over, uh, well, you're not, you're not a Kaiser person, so you have to pay this huge amount. Like, oh, sure, I'm a Kaiser person, you know? So, um, you know, just to have, um, you know, when you're not, when you're not, when you're incapacitated, you have someone to advocate for you to say, you know, they're FEHB Kaiser person, been their whole life here. Uh, let's get, let's get, let's get some access to care. Thank you. But good, good job for advocating for your mom and getting it straightened <laughs> out. Um, yeah, so, so to, to oversimplify, uh, Kaiser do, doesn't run, uh, doesn't run really the nursing homes. You know, so it's an outside nursing home. So it's very much like, um, like any of the other FEHB plans like Blue Cross or GIHA or, or letter carriers. They, you know, they, they don't really get down into the nursing home. It's a Medicare approved nursing home. The, the discharge planner gets you going from the, the hospital to the, to the uh, skilled nursing facility. And, uh, you know, so, so it's really more of uh, the plan, uh, the, your, your battle is with the plan. Uh, with well, the plan. this wasn't to pay for the nursing home. There, there were doctors who, in private practice, who would come into the nursing home to take care of the patients there. So they, they were billing through their own offices. That's what I was okay. fighting about. Okay, I th we need to go on to the uh, next question. Jeff, would you unmute yourself? Um, I was wanted to point out that Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, basic plan uh, reimburses for Part B uh, approximately $800 per individual. So that helps to... Uh, does, since you mentioned, does that, does that work pretty well for you, the reimbursement process? I have heard about it for the last several years and did it this year, and it did work out okay. uh, well. I never, I never, I, I never, I never mentioned any of the. Uh, I let, I let the plan speak for the plan. You know, like I let them do their own uh, marketing on what, uh, what kind of benefit they, they did. But uh, I'm glad it works out. Okay, Kathy. Hi, you're the next person. Please unmute yourself. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So, hi. I have Kaiser, and oh. I'm not sure this might be more of a Kaiser question, but I'll see if it makes sense. When I was doing this research last year, I found out that if I, I had standard under FEHB, and I found out that if I assigned it to Medicare, I could go down to basic that every tier of Kaiser was a $2,000 deductible, which was already less, I believe, than what I had at sta on standard. And I could make my total payment about what I paid for standard before having Medicare. So that seemed very appealing. And it's, as far as I know, that's how it's going to work. <laughs> um, my question, though, is when I got all the information, the part, I mean, it's a huge book, and the part that talks about the $2,000, I'm talking catastrophic, I, I don't think I said that, is in there. But there's also this part in there that talks about, for drugs, this gap stuff. And so I wrote to Kaiser and tried to get them to clarify as a federal employee, because the whole book is designed for federal employees. So I didn't know why they even had that gap thing in there. Yeah, you wouldn't have a gap. And the person who I had on the phone assured me I didn't have a gap, but when I wrote the letter, they wouldn't really specify there's no gap. They said your catastrophic is 2000, but they wouldn't say, and that includes part D. I mean, that includes drugs. So one is a comment that, wow, I mean, Kaiser was offering this great thing that if I went down to basic and took on Medicare, I'm paying the same as if, I did under the standard before I had Medicare. That was great. And, and the question part is, I don't have a gap. Is that correct? And the, yeah, right? that, yeah. And so, so, so what, so what they should be able to do as your FEHB plan, you, you can, you should be able to call them up and say, what's in it for me? What about this gap? You know, and they should be able to very clearly say, there ain't no gap for you. <laughs> I mean, well, that's, yeah, that's on the phone. And so, what will happen sometimes is that if you if you get into the the Kaiser regular senior advantage people who don't know anything about FEHB Kaiser, 
they'll have the wrong answer for you. Okay. So you need to you need to speak to but you need to like say uh, to the call center person, I'm Kaiser FEHB. Am I calling the right place? Because there's a whole they, they have a whole business line um, for FEHB. <laughs> that, okay. their, their job is federal employees, and that's their rules a little quirkier. We have a little bit more benefit than everyone else. And uh, they just, so, so always lead off your call saying you're FHB. I've actually had some uh, chapter members in 400, chapter 400, who were, uh, were called the general Kaiser line. And uh, they were trying to disenroll her from FEHB. And I said, no, 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 you need to. And so we got her, we got her into call the Kaiser FEHB people, their, their, their Kaiser FEHB call center, and everything was answered really, really quickly, and there were no more bumps in it. But just do that uh, if, uh, and so the best, your best ally is the brochure. The Kaiser will send you a brochure every year. Uh, FEHB, I guess they call it FEHB and you, or Kaiser Senior senior Advantage and you. Uh, well, that's the problem. I have the big booklet and the small skinny brochure and it's both for federal employees and both mm -hmm. of them have the page on the gap so that's okay. what I was trying to get them to clarify okay. um, but so Kathy Kathy send me an email and I will I will have I will I will send your uh, information to Sangeeta who's the plan manager for the Bay Area for okay. Kaiser and she can right. answer you know, <laughs> you know answer to answer you directly on what's the deal yeah, and the good news is I loved going down to basic. It's the exact same coverage, and I pay less of a premium. I, I'm basically paying to have both coverage the same amount I paid yeah. before switching. And, and I, I can't stress the importance of you know, uh, you know, all of us, you know, uh, you know, calling the FEHB plan and really saying what's in it for me. What if you have any questions about the fine print? what about this and they gotta they gotta cough up an answer for you uh, <laughs> you know because if you think about it your, your fehb is paying them you know medicare is paying them so there should be uh no no gaps and you know no no surprises uh, okay um i want to uh suggest that we have one more question it looks like uh oh yeah two more I know, but I, I think we're going to stop after one more. And uh, if if anyone wants to stay on, they can, and they can, um, and Peter will probably stay on a few more minutes as well. But I want to sort of end because I want to say a few things and then do that. But let's do one more question. Who do we have? Diane, is that the next person? Well, Yogi and then Diane. But um... Yogi had one question already. Not Diane. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Diane, can you unmute? There, you did it, sort of. You can push um, on your, um, if you're on a computer, you can push. I'm sorry, on I, I pressed and muted her again. Uh, I, Diane, one more time, try to get off of, of uh, mute. Thank you. There you go. I have a comment, a quick comment, and then a question. My comment is my husband, who was a member, was in a, a skilled nursing home and Kaiser had a doctor who visited every day. And because it was during this pandemic, was very good about communicating with me by email. So I'm surprised that someone had a, pro a problem with that. My question is, why are the premiums so much higher in Northern California than in Southern California when the benefits are basically the same? You know, I. I you know, luckily, this is the NARF uh, group. I can answer that. Uh, um, we're older, if you look at it demographically uh, or uh, actuarially. Um, we're a bunch of old feds up here. Um, so Kaiser, taking, we're talking Kaiser, right? Um, so uh, uh, because we're an older population, uh, we cost more. And so they actuarially come in and say, FEHB, we'll, we'll cover the feds up here in Northern California for this amount. It's, uh, I can't tell you how much grief I get from retired feds who go down on the Thanksgiving mm -hmm. holidays down south, um, right before open enrollment and have, uh, have uh, Thanksgiving dinner with their brothers and sisters and then they come back and like, my brother is paying half of what I paid <laughs> for self and family. What's going on up here? 
and it's uh, a function of age. Um, you know, and it, uh, you know, the federal government uh, negotiates with these plans um, in the north and at different parts of the country. So they, they, they negotiate prices for, you know, Baltimore, Seattle, Hawaii, uh, Northern, Northern California, Southern California, and just so ours is, is very high. Hawaii, by the way, is incredibly high too. That's another group of people. Once the, the Hawaiians come to the mainland for the holidays, they come back and they, they yell about how high their premiums are. So that's a very good observation. Um, I'm not advocating moving down to LA just for a lower, mm -hmm. you know, lower FEHB premium, but uh, uh, that's one thing that uh, a lot of, a lot of, um, you know, open up the NARF magazine. They always talk about the best places to live. And, you know, one of the, you know, one of the, one of the, one of the measurements is, you know, what's your FBHB premium if you want to be in a, uh, you know, like a Kaiser, you know, like a, if you want to be in Kaiser, does they have Kaiser there? And what's their, what's their premium? So every month, I mean, every year, the NARF issue that has the premiums, they, 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 it's kind of an embarrassing issue for the plants, but you can open it up and look. Oh, in Baltimore, I would be paying this much for self and family, or in Seattle, I'd be paying this much, or in LA. So uh, usually, the after that issue comes up, uh, all the chapters in Northern California are just like inflamed. I'm paying too much, <laughs> uh, but it's keep an eye on that, and then ask. Uh, um, if that's why. Yeah, uh, thanks so much, Peter. Uh, we really appreciate your time and uh, helping us with this somewhat challenging and confusing, I think, uh, topic. Um, one of the good things that's going to happen is, is that on the 23rd of September, uh, Peter's going to do the, a similar presentation for the California Federation. You'll be receiving information from the California Federation about this particular meeting. You may have a friend who's interested in it. Uh, it will also be done via Zoom, um, and so there will be an opportunity again to uh, look at the slides or whatever and also uh, ask uh, additional questions. Um, I, we are going to post these slides because there's a lot of information on the slides, uh, but we're, we're going to wait until after that presentation, which will, and so around September uh, 24th, we'll have this up and available on our website, which is north65.org. Um, and so uh, I, I think that that opportunity uh, is, is good for you as well. Um, I know that not everybody got to ask questions that they wanted to. Um, and so I'm going to try this. Um, if, if, if you got what you needed, uh, you can leave the meeting by either hanging up or clicking on the leave button if you're on a screen. Um, if not, and you still have something you want to talk about, um, we'll let you stay on the call here um, and uh, see if we can address what um, issues you might have had. So uh, thanks for participating. Thanks to the guys like Martha and, and Leslie and Pauline who helped make this happen. And thanks to Peter for spending his time with us. Uh, so you can you can log off, and this is the end of our meeting. We'll have one next month, same time, third Wednesday of the month uh, in September, and it will be with Social Security, okay? And there'll be a discussion to go into details about Social Security. Okay, thank you. <laughs>